Nvidia, AMD or Intel, which is the best GPU brand that you should buy in 2024? This can be a bit of a tricky question, but hopefully by the end of the video, you'll have your answer, as I'm going to cover each GPU brand and what they do well and what they don't do so well. So stick around and let's find out. I'm not going to beat around the bush and I'm going to get straight into the first one with Nvidia. This is everyone's favorite graphics card brand and they basically just dominate the GPU market right now. They've got some obscene market share. I don't know what it is off the top of my head, but it's the vast majority. And at one point they were the most valuable company in the world in terms of their market cap. I'm not too sure if they are now, but anyways, back to their GeForce gaming graphics cards and here they've objectively got the best technology. Nvidia has DLSS, CUDA and the pioneered real-time ray tracing with their RTX 20 series GPUs and they've built upon it ever since. This has given GeForce graphics cards the edge in terms of performance with ray tracing enabled as comparable AMD graphics cards. They can't really keep up with a GeForce counterpart when ray tracing is turned on. But when it's turned on, it does tend to eat quite a bit at your performance. So luckily, NVIDIA, well, they invented DLSS to make up for the performance loss. This is objectively the best upscaler on the market right now, as it leverages the tensor cores in NVIDIA graphics cards to upscale the image, and it provides a much sharper and cleaner image compared to AMD's FSR upscaler. And DLSS is so good, it's been considered to be better than native in a lot of games, which to be honest to me, isn't that much of a surprise because they're baked in TAA implementation in many new modern A, modern A? Modern AAA titles is pretty garbage and it just makes the game look fuzzy. And DLSS totally overrides this and it can provide a sharper image. And with the RTX 40 series graphics cards, they're incredibly efficient. Like I was testing the RTX 4070 Super recently, which you can watch in a video up there, and that's got better than RTX 3080 levels of performance while consuming like 100 watts less in total, which is absolutely wild because my biggest problem with the 3080 is it's quite power hungry, so it's good to see that Nvidia really worked on their efficiency. Despite all their good points, Nvidia also does some things very wrongly in my opinion. Most notably, they are very apprehensive of putting VRAM, particularly on their mid to lower end graphics cards. Like if we look at the RTX 4060 and 4060 Ti, these only have eight gigabytes of VRAM, which for the price you're going to be paying for one of these graphics cards is kind of a joke in my opinion, because you can, basically spend the same amount of money as the RTX 4060 and get a 6700 XT which has 12 gigabytes of VRAM which is four more and it should handily outperform a 4060 as well. And if we look back a generation to Ampere they put eight gigabytes of VRAM on a 3070 which was at the time it wasn't too bad but we kind of knew it wasn't going to live that long because eight gigabytes back then was it was enough but it wasn't very future proof, I guess is the point I'm getting at. And they also put eight gigabytes on the previous two 70 class graphics cards as well, which was a bit weird. Also the 3080 only had 10 gigabytes. I know there was a soft relaunch of a 3080 with 12 gigabytes, but it should have been 12 from the start, I think. But back to the modern 40 series graphics cards and another problem I've got with them is the value amongst most of their graphics card lineup is pretty questionable. Like the 4060 and 4060 Ti and the 4060 Ti 16 gigabyte are just not very good value in my opinion. Them them just not worth it because you may as well just buy an AMD graphics card and get more performance and more VRAM at the same, maybe even less money. And then even with like the RTX 4080 when that launched, that was like $1,200 where the 3080, if you could get it at retail, was like $649. So that made no sense either. So their value lineup is, it's been kind of adjusted with the Super Series graphics cards, but for the most part, AMD just tends to batter Nvidia on value. <laughs> And that's where the downsides of Nvidia are the pros for AMD because the absolute value proposition of AMD is very good in my opinion. Cards like the 7900 GRE, 7800 XT and even if you look back a generation with the 6700 XT and the RX 6600 are all the best in class in terms of their value in my opinion. But it's not only that though, 
AMD tends to give their graphics cards a lot of VRAM. If we look at around the sort of $400 to $500 price point, you've got the 6700 XT and you've got the 7900 GRE, which both have 16 gigabytes of VRAM. This is a lot of frame buffer and you won't be running into any issues with 16 gigabytes in the foreseeable future even at 4K. Whereas the closest NVIDIA competitor at this price point, the RTX 4070 Super, that only has 12 gigabytes. Yes, that's totally fine for now, but you're just getting more value with that AMD graphics card. The 7900 GRE is faster in rasterization as well. Yeah, it will consume a bit more power, but it's got more VRAM and it runs faster as well. I think I know which GPU I'd take. Yes, I know the 4070 Super has GDDR6X memory, which is faster, but the AMD card's got more of it and it's got a better memory bus as well. So that does kind of level it out in my opinion. And if you're sitting there thinking, haha, AMD's got bad drivers, you either haven't used the Radeon card for the past five years, or you're just echoing someone else's opinion. Because in my opinion, AMD Radeon drivers are absolutely solid now, they've got Virtually just no problems outside of like the minor crashes you'll get here and there, but that happens with Nvidia cards as well. And I believe Adrenaline Software is better than GeForce Experience. For one, you don't need to sign into it, and you can undervolt, overclock, and all that sort of thing within the application, which is a big bonus in my opinion. I know the Nvidia app is on the horizon, but it's not out of beta yet, so it doesn't really count. There are some downsides to AMD, and most notably, the lacking DLSS. FSR is great, but it doesn't provide as clean as an image as what DLSS is able to do. This is because FSR doesn't leverage any tensor cores, as you can run it on GPUs as old as like the GTX 1080, or even something as old as like a Maxwell graphics card. So that is a big pro for FSR. It's a lot more compatible and more open to much to a much larger proportion of graphics cards. But in turn for that, you are lacking some quality. And if you want an AMD graphics card, I highly recommend keeping it to rasterization. This is because their ray tracing performance will lag behind comparable NVIDIA graphics cards. And that's just the way it is because NVIDIA has been working on ray tracing much longer than what AMD has. And then there's also the efficiency standpoint with RDNA 3. It's not terrible compared to Ada Lovelace, mainly because the 40 series is just so efficient. So it's not like it's the R9 days or anything where AMD was like memed upon for how much power it consumes and how hot they get. So the power consumption of RDNA 3 is essentially more than 40 series for the same performance, but it's not really make or break if I'm being honest. So essentially the crux of AMD is if you want a great value card with plenty of VRAM and you don't really care about ray tracing or DLSS, they're the graphics card for you because the value you can get with AMD and Team Red, it's basically second to none. Two years ago, I would have started wrapping up the video here, but Intel released their Arc Discrete graphics cards and I think they're pretty valid for quite a few of you out there. Yes, the drivers aren't the best. Intel have only started getting on top of the driver game, I'd like to say, because most games will just run totally fine now, but they do have some areas of improvement with the drivers, like unlocking more performance in select games and reducing their driver overhead. This is the, probably one of the biggest problems I've got with their driver package is compared to AMD and Nvidia, Intel drivers will hit the CPU harder. So if you're CPU bound, you will be losing more performance, particularly compared to AMD and Nvidia. Also, Arc Control could definitely do with some improvements. It's not the best piece of software in the world and it's the worst out of all the driver package software, I'd like to say, as there's still no hotkey for recording. Like Intel, what are you doing? Release a hotkey for recording please. Like AMD and Nvidia have had this for years. There's, there's no excuse, come on. Another downside to Intel graphics cards is they need resizable bar because without this crucial feature, their performance is pretty awful. There's, there's no other word for it. It's pretty awful. You can see in a video up there because without resizable bar, they're, they're absolutely terrible. So if your PC doesn't support this feature, don't even consider one of these graphics cards. And the last downside of our graphics cards is they kind of consume quite a lot of power and they're not that efficient. 
The RK750 to get RX 6600 XT levels of performance needs to consume like an extra 80-ish watts, which is quite a bit of power. And yeah, it just means it's like really inefficient and you'll be spending more year on year in terms of your energy bill and you might need to fork out on a better power supply as well. It's not all doom and gloom with Intel though, because they do have some tricks up their sleeve. XESS is the second best upscaler in my opinion and it's much closer to DLSS than what it is to FSR. Yes, to get the most out of it you do need an ARC graphics card as it will leverage the tensor cores which are built into the ARC discrete GPUs. Also, the encoding capabilities on ARC is absolutely amazing. I ran the A750 before I tried to test out AMD in my editing rig and it ran perfectly fine. QuickSync was great. I never really use the AV1 encoder, but ARC graphics cards are some of the cheapest GPUs with AV1 encoders. So if you need one of those, ARC's quite a good option there as well. And their ray tracing performance is kind of surprisingly good. It's not the most playable experience in the world, but when you compare it to like a 6600 or 6600 XT, ARC graphics cards will ray trace better than them, which is kind of a benefit in my opinion. And last but not least, their excellent value. With the A750 being one of my most favorite budget graphics cards in 2024, as you can get one of these for around $200. And I think for that price point, if you've got a PC which supports resizable bar and you've got a relatively decent CPU and you don't really mind the odd driver problem here and there, the RK750 is an absolutely valid graphics card and you can even go out and buy the arc a770 16 gigabyte which to my knowledge is the cheapest 16 gigabyte graphics card on the new market so if you just need a ton of vram that gpu is also an option for you as well so which gpu is best for you if you're gaming i really think you can't go wrong with any of them if you need dlss and ray tracing Nvidia is the go-to for you. If you're after value, a ton of VRAM, and you're going to be playing at rasterization, AMD is a good option right here. And if you want a budget graphics card with excellent productivity and encoding capabilities, the Arc lineup of GPUs is not a bad option either. It's all down to what you want out of your PC, and what sort of money you want to spend. I'm going to list some of my recommended GPUs in the description below with my Amazon affiliate links. I do make a small keep back from these, but if you want to check any of them out, they will be linked down there. But if you want to see how my two favorite budget graphics cards get on against each other, I've got a video up there for it. With that being said, I'll catch you in the next one.